So my story really began uh, when I was 13, when a close family friend who was like an uncle to me actually passed away of pancreatic cancer. And when the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more. So I went online to find answers. And using Google and Wikipedia, I found a vast array of statistics on these cancers. But what I found really shocked me. You see, 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. And I kept digging, and I was like, why are we so bad at detecting pancreatic cancer? And that's when I stumbled across an even more shocking statistic. The current test is this six-year-old test. I mean, first off, that's older than my dad. But also, it costs $800 per test and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all cancers. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. And so I set out, armed with eighth grade biology, to, I was unhappy with this, I was going to change the face of cancer diagnostics. I was like, I got this with my eighth grade biology. And uh, my kind of rationale was, well, the current test is just so bad that anything I do would probably be better. <laughs> and so armed with that mentality, I went out and I found what a sensor for pancreatic cancer would really have to look like. It would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. And and then I was doing some more research, and that's when um, I found that when we're looking at the cancer, we're looking at your bloodstream. And what we're looking for is these changes in protein levels. And while this sounds really straightforward, it's anything but. You see you have these liters and liters of blood that's already abundant in an innumerable amount of protein. And you're looking for this one small change in this tiny amount of protein, so it's next to impossible. It's like trying to find a needle in a stack of nearly identical needles. However, undeterred to my teenage optimism, or how some people label it, complete and utter ignorance of the entire field of cancer research, I continued on and went to any high schooler's best sources for information, Google, Wikipedia, how I got through every high school test and quiz, and eventually I stumbled across this article of over 8,000 proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have these cancers. And it was my summer break, I literally had nothing else to do, and I was pretty antisocial at the time, so I shut myself in my room and researched all 8,000 proteins. At the end of the summer, I was really doubting my potential for any future social interaction. <laughs> and made for some really interesting back-to-school essays. So my teacher would ask my friend, like, oh, what did you do? And he was like, I went to Yellowstone. Jack, what did you do? I researched proteins. <laughs> There's an awkward pause. I never shook the name uh, Protein Kid after that. However, on the 4,000th try, when I was close to losing my sanity, I finally found the one protein that could work. And the name of this protein was called mesothelin. And it's just an ordinary, round-of-the-mill type protein, unless, of course, you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer, in which case it's found these very high levels in your bloodstream. But also, the key is, is that it's found in the earliest stages of the disease, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So if you could detect this protein, you could potentially detect the cancer in the earliest stage, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. And however, now the question was, how on earth am I going to detect this protein? And the answer came in the most unlikely of places, high school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation. Particularly with my biology teacher, we just didn't get along. And one day, tensions rose to record highs, and I rebelled how any high schooler would. I snuck in an article on single-walled carbon nanotubes. And these are essentially these long, thin tubes of carbon that are an atom thick, and they're 150,000th the diameter of a single strand of your hair. So they're extremely small, but they have these amazing properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. So like they're stronger than steel, or they conduct electricity better than copper. And so I'm just fascinated by these, and I felt really James Bond-esque. I'd like wedge this article in between the pages of my biology textbook. And then out of the corner of my ear, we were learning about these things called antibodies. And that's essentially like a lock and key. It would only react to one specific protein, in this case, that cancer biomarker. And I was just sitting there, reading this article, when all of a sudden it hit me. 
you could combine these two concepts. And essentially what you do is you have a network of these nanotubes and you lace it with these antibodies, such that you have a carbon substance that will only react to one specific protein. But also, due to the amazing properties of these nanotubes, this network will actually change how electricity flows through it based on the amount of protein present, and thus indicate whether or not you have pancreatic cancer. And uh, it's essentially analogous to a big bowl of spaghetti noodles with meatballs in it. If you imagine the spaghetti noodles were uh, conductors, then when you put the meatballs in, it would spread neighboring spaghetti noodles apart, and that would cause a change in electrical conductivity since there's less connections. And you can actually measure that with a $10 ohmmeter that you steal from your dad's garage. And then I thought, well, these networks of nanotubes are extremely flimsy, and since they're so delicate, they need to be supported. So I chose to use paper. And making a paper sensor for pancreatic cancer is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I personally love. If I ever do bad on a test, you had better watch out for the chocolate chip cookies, especially those Girl Scout cookies, which are now in season, thankfully. But all you do is you take some water, you pour in some nanotubes, add some antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and you can detect cancer. And just as soon as I had this kind of epiphany moment, I look up and I see my biology teacher. I swear she has eyes on the back of her head. She storms up all red in the face, snatches that article, and is like, what is this actual science doing in my classroom? At least that's what I thought she said. She probably said something more along the lines like, do your class or else I'll fail you. However, I finally got my article back after having to beg for it for 30 minutes and listen about how I have to respect myself and others. But finally I got back, and that's all I really cared about. And then I realized I'm probably going to need a lab to do this research. I can't do cancer research on my kitchen countertop. Me and my brother had done some pretty crazy shenanigans, like we cultured E. coli and cholera, where we make our sandwiches. Fortunately, the CDC didn't have to be called in. Also, we knocked out the electricity to all of our neighborhood once. We're terrible neighbors. We're notorious for knocking out the power. And then also, we landed ourselves on the FBI watch list. Well, my mom, because we used her credit card for some rather dubious items. <laughs> However... I was probably going to need a lab to do this research, so I was like, all right, I can just email 200 different professors and someone will tell me yes. And I was prepared for all these positive emails to pour in for me to be like, hey, all this wonder boy saves the world. Then reality struck. Got 199 rejections. And I realized some professors aren't nearly as nice as those glowing profile pictures make them seem. Some of them actually went line by line through my entire procedure saying why it was the worst possible mistake I could ever make and that I should just quit doing science. And um, I have no clue where they got that time. I mean, maybe instead of like regular hobbies like crocheting or golf, they would like making fun of 16-year-olds. But finally, a silver lining came through, and I got one positive email from Dr. Anirban Maitra at Johns Hopkins University. And I go in for this big interview armed with my professional gear of a hoodie and pajama pants. And I was expecting a standard interview like, oh, what's your favorite color? What do you want to be when you grow up? Unfortunately, this guy knew his stuff. I couldn't bamboozle him like my parents. My parents, I just say, cancer, carbon nanotubes. And they're like, yeah, Jack, go do your science. This guy actually brought in 28 PhDs. We probably set some sort of Guinness World Book of Records here. He crammed them in a nine foot by nine foot room and they just interrogated me on every part of my project. However, eventually I stumbled out of this interrogation, I guessed C on all the answers I didn't know, just like I do on my SATs. That worked out pretty well. And finally, I got the lab space I needed. And just as soon as I started, I realized how hopeless I was at doing cancer research. First day was cultured some cancer cells and I accidentally uh, sneezed in my cancer flask. And he just kind of hid it away and denied its existence after that because tentacles were going out of it. And then, for example, I'd like trip over my shoelaces and just face plant on my cells, or like I'd blow them up in the centrifuge. And at this point, my lab mentor was like, why on earth did I ever invite this kid into my laboratory? However, after all of that, after seven months of screwing up every single procedure and oftentimes sleeping over at the lab, 
I finally ended up with one small paper sensor that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. This makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than conventional methods of detection. But also, so far, it has over 90% accuracy at detecting the cancer and can detect the cancer in the earliest stage when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could potentially lift the one's dismal pancreatic cancer survival rates from 5.5% to close to 100%. And it would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But it wouldn't stop there. You see, you can simply switch out the antibody as simple as switching out chocolate chips or butterscotch chips and cookies, and you can detect an entirely different protein, ranging from Alzheimer's, other forms of cancer, even HIV AIDS and heart disease. The possibilities for its disease detection is limitless, and it could go far beyond that in water contaminant detection and more. And I know a lot of people wonder, what on earth is Jack working on next? So um, actually what happened is my lab mentor moved down to MD Anderson, and so I can't make that commute. But uh, now I'm working on cancer-fighting nanorobots that will actually learn how to treat your cancer while in your bloodstream. So that's my current project. But uh, throughout these journeys, I face a lot of adversity. I mean... I got told no by my parents, I got told no by my biology teacher, I got told no by 199 professors. But um, one of the greatest difficulties I faced throughout this journey was that of scientific paywalls. And this is where you essentially have to cost, cough up $35 per article in order to read it. And this exponentially raises the cost of doing innovation for kids like me. And by instituting these paywalls, we've created a fundamental barrier between the public and science, where we have all these big STEM initiatives that say we need more kids interested in science, but when a Katy Perry single costs 99 cents and a seminal science article costs $35, that's a bit of a mixed message. And this isn't just a problem for 15-year-old cancer researchers, this is really a problem for everyone because... Harvard University recently released a statement saying that we simply can't afford to continue paying for these subscriptions. And when the richest academic institution in the world can't afford to continue paying for its academic subscriptions, how can you expect young innovators to be able to do scientific research? And I think... And right now, essentially what's happened is we have this really rigid class hierarchy in terms of access to scientific knowledge, where at the top we have um, big institutions like Harvard University and Stanford that can afford every single subscription, and those are like the knowledge elite. But even here in the knowledge elite, we have the stratification where at the top we have all those big institutions with, with large endowments. But then lower down, we have state-run institutions who don't have as large of endowments and can't afford every single scientific subscription. And so it's essentially like saying to the top 10 universities, you all can teach calculus, while everyone else is relegated to only Algebra 1. And then below this, we have the knowledge middle class, people like you or me, who can afford a few articles here and there and access the few open access journals. But then below that is the knowledge underclass, those 5.5 billion people who can't access the internet whatsoever. And so essentially what we have is a knowledge aristocracy, where only 0.008% of the world's population, that's, those are the only people who can access scientific information. So it's like taking 80 people off the street of Boston and saying, you are the only ones who can access information to all those other millions of people, too bad for you. And then below this, we have the knowledge, uh, knowledge underclass, which is 85% of the world's population who lacks access to knowledge and lives in knowledge poverty. But imagine if we li could live in a knowledge democracy, where what you look like, age, or gender doesn't apply. Whether you're from Cambodia to China, from Malaysia to Mexico, whether you're a billionaire or living on less than a dollar a day, you'd have the exact same access to knowledge. Because science shouldn't be a luxury, and knowledge shouldn't be a commodity. It should be a basic human right. And the minds of the people must be free, and that means the minds of everyone, not the minds of the select few who can afford these articles. And I think that we can establish this uh, change, because think, if a 15-year-old who didn't quite know what a pancreas was could find a new way to detect pancreatic cancer, just imagine what we all can do together. Thank you.